this is not the first time we've had Dr. Jim uh, uh, here, burned here. Uh, I don't know, I was going to ask him how many times he's already been here. Oh, he doesn't know. I can remember at least three, so whatever. Uh, and, and he's being quite courageous to take a look at this question, climate en energy uh, suitability, uh, where are we and where do we go? Uh, he's eminently uh, uh, able to answer that question, so I'm really looking to, to forward to his presentation. And, uh, and so um, he doesn't like long introductions, so they're short. So here we go, Jim. You come forward, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mary. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's nice to see so many old friends. Um, I don't always get here because I was not retired, and now I am retired, and so it's going to be a lot easier to get here. Although I still have grants and three PhD candidates and more coming in, and so I don't know, you know, I'm in the university. Smart university, dumb gym maybe. I'm working for free now for them, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to just, we're a little, little, let's see, here we go, yes, survey, audience participation. I like to do this with all my audiences, and a few of you may remember this from last time. If you grew up in a location with a cold winter climate, please raise your right, right hand high. Keep them up, keep them up. If when you were a little duffer or duffette, your parents said, don't put your tongue on cold metal in winter, then keep your hands up, okay? If you put your tongue on cold metal in winter, please keep your hands up. <laughs> wow, that's, that's about as many as I've ever had, I think, that have done that. Okay, that's, uh, I've done that with like large groups of scientists at, at international meetings, and it's amazing, you know, how many of them have all done it. It's just, somehow we just have to, you know, we need that data, we need verification, right? So yeah, so thank you for participating in that survey. It gives me a sense of, you know, I don't think fine artists are, you know, they, they're smart enough to listen to their parents right off, you know, maybe, so anyway. Okay, so I've got, I, I, I wrote my presentation last night, everything was ready, oh, I was just so happy about it, and then I went, whew, whatever, 77 slides. And they told me, how long? Okay, so I got up this morning and I was cut, 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 so hopefully it doesn't sound too, um, you know, confusing. Uh, I've tried to put a lot of information into a short presentation. So climate change, we are at a crossroads. If you're me, and knowing what I know, you're both terrified and excited. And I think we should all be terrified and excited. Because if we go the right way, it's great. There's many things we can do. It's still going to hurt. We've, we've gone too far, and there's going to be some pain with climate change. But there's some really exciting things that can happen if we really address it. Uh, if we don't address it, it's terrifying. Now, speaking of terrifying, Premier Smith, I can't resist. She's cast, cast a hook, and I'm going to take it. And, you know, I mean, I've had more than one deputy premier tell my, my uh, president that they hate my guts and they wish I wasn't here. Maybe I can inspire Premier Smith similarly. She said, apparently this morning or yesterday, reliable energy or renewable energy is unreliable and Alberta should build more gas fired power plants for a more predictable source of electricity. Oh God, Danielle, you need to understand science. Who the hell is advising you on science? Okay, that is so, natural gas is as bad as coal. You know, the leakage of natural gas, and I probably don't have to tell most of this audience, you've all known it for, you know, years that that's the case. So we have a badly, uh, a premium who's badly informed on science. You could get somebody else here to Maybe Trevor will in a few weeks. Trevor Harrison can go over all of the different ways they're misinformed. Anyway, I also had to throw this in. This came up this morning on my news feed. Um, these are research scientists from Harvard, legal specialists. Harvard's a pretty good school, almost as good as University of Lethbridge. Um, you know, and they've published this uh, article saying that they really feel prosecutions for climate homicides are getting to the point where perhaps it's legitimate. Um, and and, and I, I feel, yeah, go on. 
Okay? There has been irresponsible action on the behalf of, of oil, gas, coal executives and many other executives and corporations who have not been held accountable. Um, I've, I've espoused this before. It was wonderful to see it in a legal, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a referee paper, in a really good legal journal by very reputable legal researchers. So anyway, um, we'll see. Maybe this will, will uh, you know, cause them to, to think a little more or a lot more. So let's think about this. So where are we? So I'm going to spend about half time on where are we, or maybe a little less than half time, and then the other half on where we can go. And a lot of it, again, will, you know, it's not that new. So I think we'll be able to speed through my slides here. So where are we right now? Well, I'm sure most of you, again, because I think this is an informed crowd, IPCC, you know, the, the uh, AR6 report is out, and essentially, final warning. We are really reaching what we think will be the tipping point. If we don't do a lot in the next 10 years, then, you know, I'll, probably many of us, and we're all pretty much a peer group, I think, pretty close. You know, many of us are in a lot of trouble. Our children are in deep trouble. Our grandchildren are in deep, deep trouble. Uh, the climate is going to be changing radically and causing all kinds of problems. So um, this is, I just grabbed the 1950 to 22 data, and I just wanted to show you this plot. I know that you probably can't see it, but that's about on the, on the, uh, the y-axis, that's about one degree of warming. So, you know, since 1950, the planet, the entire planet has warmed around one degree, 1.1, 1 .1, right? So, um, and, and, and that's certainly, you know, a concern. Based upon that 1.1 and where we're going, the IPC synthesis report has really said, and I was going to put in a whole bunch of bullet points about what they said. Essentially, it comes to, oh boy, this is really, really bad for the planet and for humanity, right? So we need to make some changes. How about for us? What's going to happen to good old Alberta and good old southern Alberta, okay? Um, well, here's 1950 to 2022. That's NOAA data to say how much it's warming in Alberta. And if you have a quick look at that, you'll see that it's about almost two degrees. We're warming at almost twice the rate of the globe. So that's going to cause some stress for us, right? Um, oh, and again, that's just NOAA data. So, um, so we have to reduce greenhouse gases to lower warming by 2100. We have to actually reduce them by 2030 dramatically, right? And I don't know, is this diagram fairly visible? I'm finding, can I turn this screen up a little bit, Canute? Do you know, is it, can it, will it go a little brighter? That's it. Oh, that's it, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tough it out, don't worry. Um, so yeah, so you know, even if uh, the 1.5 degree that IPCC says we should stay under, and the Paris Agreement said we should stay under, that's with really reduced emissions. That's really you know, getting our emissions to flat very quickly. Um, and and you know, we're nowhere near doing that, right? So that's something we really need to do. So if we go with where we're going right now, the way emissions are going, that's 2.7 degrees globally. If Alberta continues on the same trend, that's 5.4. That's really frightening for us. <coughs> and who knows, maybe other changes, maybe there'll be some things that we don't anticipate, but, but really frightening. So anyway, oh, that's really interesting. So there's that Alberta average, so five degrees in 2100, is that where we think we're going to go? Is that where we think we want to go? Is that where we want our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to be? Um, it means there's a heck of a lot of change coming in the meantime, and we may be looking literally at heat waves, cooling centers, drought, um, massive storms, you know, hailstorms that take out large parts. I mean, the hailstorm in Northeast Calgary, one of the biggest weather events in Canada, and you know what? For the first time, governments have abandoned those people. They haven't really helped them recover fully like they did in to, from previous really big events. So. And here's, here's the, the, those four big events, Fort McMurray fires, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the 2013 flood in Calgary, and the hailstorms in 2020 and 2021 are the, are the big events that have hit Alberta. So we're doing four out of 10 for big events. We really are in a dynamic, I don't have to tell you, you know that you, know, you, can, you can go to bed and it can be 27 below and you can wake up and it can be 10 above, right? We are really in a dynamic climate zone. 
And how all of those interactions from the Pacific and from the North and from the South happen all the time are really, you know, make our climate highly variable. And this is probably going to drive it to much greater variability. So unprecedented weather extremes. That's where we're already at now. You know, the BC fires a couple of years ago, right? The temperatures were off the scales. Australia for years has been adding to their temperature scales because they get such hot summers. Um, you know, it's happening all over. Pakistan and India, we're worried, will not be inhabitable as they are now for a number of months of the year, where literally they might have to, the economy might slow way down and the people just have to hide in cooling centers for weeks, possibly months, right? In the not too distant future. So if we don't fix it, you know, we're, we can expect much worse. And natural gas power plants are not the way to fix it, Danielle. <laughs> okay? Climate refugees. Now, for the most part, we think climate refugees are going to be a problem for somebody else. We're far away. They're not going to swim up the, either the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, right? Not really. There will be huge pressure on us to take on climate refugees. And in 2022, and I can't remember the, oh, that's from The Guardian, but it's from referee work and government work. Three million U.S. citizens were displaced or migrated around due to extreme weather in 2022. What if they, how many of them might want to come here? Um, you know, uh, that's not, not a pleasant perspective. As much as we like to say we love our American friends, we don't always like them very much. They're really quite different, uh, different cultures, different perspectives, so, so, you know, who knows. So IPCC has said extreme weather could start to display, no, sorry, extreme weather now is displacing 20 million a year globally. They're going to want to come here. We're perceived as massive, big open space with nobody here. They're going to want to come here. And there's going to be huge political, social, perhaps even you know, violent. I've, I've, some of my colleagues at, at the American Geophysical Union, I referenced in their papers about how violence goes up with increasing temperature dramatically, whether it's fighting with your neighbor or wholesale war. Violence goes up. That's just to give you a bar chart, most of the refugees right now are in Asia and Africa, um, but North America, South America are not. You know, we have our refugee problem, and we're all going to have to deal with this refugee problem. So the best way to deal with this refugee problem, we're all wonderful, nice people. We will help refugees, but you know what, no matter what, when you mix people of radically different cultures and so forth, you're going to have a lot of stress. So if we're going to have to take five million refugees, that's going to create tremendous strain on resources, on cultural, on political, on social resources, right? Um, the best thing we can do is try to make a much better home for them. So anyway, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So, and this is the worst case scenario that I could find from anybody. Okay, and this is from Kinsey and Company, who I don't really have a lot of faith in, actually, but Kinsey and Company and others came up with, they eventually think that 1.2 billion people could be displaced by 2050. That's a heck of a refugee camp, right? So, one other thing I want to mention, because everybody, you know, this is so, given so little attention relative to climate change, and I think sometimes this is worse. You know, air pollution, climate change isn't killing, we don't think, isn't killing anywhere near 9 million people a year. Air pollution is, okay? 9 million people a year are dying of air pollution-related diseases. And the health care costs are in the trillions of dollars. Health care costs alone are a great reason to get the hell off of fossil fuels. Absolutely, totally no more fossil fuels, right? Because the costs for just health care costs in trillions of dollars are, are, are you know. Um, and yes, I think that picture shows up. The, the, the air pollution is terrible in Lahore. The air pollution is terrible sometimes in Beijing. The air pollution is terrible in Delhi sometimes, right? But you know what? The death rate per million between Canada and China and other places in the developing world from air pollution is not that different. And so that implies to me, and I've talked to medical scientists about it, you know, medical, medical researchers, and can you get me any more on this? Because I looked up the numbers, 
And in Canada, you know, it's, 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 it's about sort of like 600 for Canada and 800 for China in terms of the death rate per million. So that, that tells me that once you're exposed to a certain amount of air pollution toxin, that's all it takes to tip you over if you're sensitive, you know, and we're all probably quite sensitive. So, you know, the fact that you're not in air pollution in the Lahore, try this. I live just a couple blocks down here in London Road, and now that I'm used, now that I look for it, air pollution from vehicles, even our vehicles that are fairly good technology, is like secondhand smoke was 15 years ago. We're used to it. We're used to breathing it and we don't notice it, right? Just like you didn't notice Aunt Hazel's secondhand smoke 15 or 20 years ago, right? You were used to breathing it. Um, but you know what, if you actually, when you're walking down on a nice quiet street, and I'm, I'm out early in the morning walking my little puppy at 7 a.m., and I, just one car goes by, and I'm on the east side of the street, and I go, yep, I'm going to be in air pollution for the rest of this block, and I can smell it the whole way, right? So we're all getting too much air pollution. Oh, I should have gone to Lethbridge, because we have air pollution here, too. So, I know. <laughs> I am a depressing bastard, um, you know, and I say others have used much, much, as I say, the deputy premier told the president hates my guts and doesn't want me involved in anything, um, you know, but that's just because they were doing the wrong thing and I told them. So anyway, apparently I haven't learned. Danielle, maybe she'll, maybe she'll go for a beer with me tonight. I'll, I, should, I should call her and see what she says. Does she, maybe she watches Sackpaw online, we'll see what happens, okay? Yeah. Okay, let's try to be less depressing. Where? Do we go? And a lot of this you've all heard before. You know, um, my old friend and colleague Dave Major is sitting right over here. Dave and I had a project called the Nat Christie Climate and Agriculture Research Project from 1992 to 96. We got a million bucks. It was really a cool project. We did a, a, some amazing work. Dave's crop modeling still stands up today. You know, the work that we did back then. Now, a scientist isn't going to say, no, we solved the problem in 92 to 96, so I don't need any more money, right? We still want to do more research, but we are, there are important things to research, but we did some really good work way back then, way back in the early 90s. Um, but so, where, but where, where are we going to go now? Well, in 2015, I was involved with a group of about 70 academics across Canada. I was one of the co-leaders, um, and I was like, what are we going to do? Canute, you didn't tell me you put vodka in that. Holy mackerel. <laughs> um, and and uh, so we wrote this report, Acting on Climate Change. I'm going to tell you quickly what it says. And you know what? It is nice. Justin is kind of more or less sort of in a way doing this. He does recognize the value, and I think he's recognized it for quite a while. But just a little background I thought I'd throw in. If God wanted us to have unlimited cheap energy, she would have put a giant fusion reactor in the sky. Well, it turns out she did, right? And so we pointed out in 2015 that, hey, we can really take advantage of the sun, particularly right where we live. We are, you know, if, if receiving solar radiation makes us some kind of royalty, then we are Canada's royalty. We get about as much as anybody, right? Um, so. That's where, all the, that's where all the solar radiation comes in. I mean, there's other places where there's great solar radiation, but we're strategically located so we can get to the grid, too. If we put in a lot of solar panels, you know, we can, we can generate a lot of electricity, right? And so that's a, that's a good thing for Southern Alberta. Uh, so we're going to see a lot more of these, right? We're also... Does anybody notice that sometimes it's a little breezy here? <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, yeah. So we're also kind of, you know, the windy spot in Western Canada. I'm only, I'm only doing Western Canada. We came up with a plan for Eastern Canada, Western Canada, very similar. Just we don't think there's any point in trying to get across Northern Ontario with too many power wires. You know, it's just too far and there's nobody there, right? So two, two sections of the country should develop. So anyway, so, you know, we have all this wind, again, in this region, and we're proximal to the grid. So let's put in wind. Let's put in solar. We should have a lot more of these. People make up more stories about these, you know, and I always get it. I, I actually joined, um, you know, there's, a, there's Transalta has proposed a wind farm down just near Cardston, a little west of Cardston. And I joined that group on Facebook. Woo! Boy, oh boy, for a group of people that I would have thought on average or maybe a little more religious, did I get called a lot of names, you know, uh, for just trying to clarify, you know, what is good and what is bad about wind, you know. So, yeah. And just the, the one that comes up the most, 
oh, these things kill so many birds. <laughs> How many of you have a cat? How many of you have a pet cat? <laughs> if you let your pet cat outside, you are a bigger part of the problem by probably 10,000 times, because cats kill something in the billions of birds every year. The Audubon Society, they don't hate cats. They're nice people and they love everybody, but the Audubon Society says build turbines because they will save something like half of our bird species from either being extirpated or go extinct. And so they're not worried about the thousands of birds that wind turbines kill. They're worried about the billions of birds that cats kill. And, and, and climate change will probably be worse than cats for birds. So anyway, grid scale batteries. This is great. Te the, the technology is going down, down, down. You know, I mean, the cost, I'll, I'll show you. Well, you know, yeah, it just getting cheaper and cheaper. You know, as we, as, we, as we develop this more, the technology is wonderful. You know, solar and wind are already the cheapest energy we can add to our energy mix, right? And batteries, Oh my God, the prices are going down. I was talking like, we all know about lithium, you know, lithium batteries, but now they're looking at sulfur batteries that have densities 10, maybe even 100 times uh, better than lithium. And so all we need to do is turn those, you know, chemical engineers and some chemists and some others, you know, give them some research money and say, make batteries better and they'll do it. And they are doing it, okay? So battery prices, wonderful. So this is the Western Canadian plan. Solar wind batteries in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Build them. Build them as fast as we can. Get off fossil fuel. There's existing hydro in BC. Important point with hydro, don't build anymore. Hydro, new hydro is not clean or green. Okay, when you build a new hydro reservoir, you end up oxidizing all of the carbon and the, all the other nutrients that are stored in the soil, on, in that soil for thousands of years, and that all comes out. The mega project in northern BC on the Peace River, the, the, uh, you know, the big dam they're building there now, won't be carbon neutral until the mid-2040s. Okay, so it's not a good project. We've got lots of existing hydro. We've already, we've already been through that pain. We've paid those greenhouse gases and that oxidation, right? So anyway, so what we need to do is strengthen the connections between the provinces, right? And all that happens is now, and you know, the way it's going, solar wind battery will probably meet demands 95% of the time. But for that 5%, it's nice to be connected to the, to the um, hydro. Um, and then together, we, I say we overbuild solar wind battery here. That gives us lots of energy for the future. And we link with the hydro and we can become a really great source of electrical energy for the United States. And they're going to need lots of energy and they don't have meaningful existing hydro. Okay, so big green energy exports. How am I doing for time? Where's some, um, Mary? Yeah, you've got six minutes. Oh, okay, let's fly. Renewables at the University of Lethbridge, okay? Not just premiers don't listen. My wonderful administration wouldn't listen, okay? We analyzed what could happen with the University of Lethbridge if we went. This is what could happen, okay? Um, the University of Lethbridge, those orangey bars were what we were spending monthly for 2014. That's what we were spending in thousands of dollars. So 300, 250, 350. That's what we were spending to buy electricity from the grid. We said, let's put in this, here's a renewable design. We can pay for it completely and we will save almost all of that money. That, those dark bars would be our electrical bills during those months. Mm -hmm. So the university could save, at this point, the university bill has gone up from 3.3 million to somewhere around 5.7 with increases in costs and the new great big building and things like that and the fact that the administration wouldn't listen back in, you know, when they started the building, I said, oh, for God's sakes, make the building really electrically efficient because that's where we're going, they wouldn't listen. Anyway, private cars, they're on the way out, okay? Now, if you've got an electric car, cool. If you need a car desperately, buy an electric car if you can. Okay? Otherwise, keep driving your old beater and keep it as efficient as you can. The, the new, the, the renewable, the energy, the, the resources we have to put in a new car are huge. So, you know, if you don't need a new car, stick with it. Stick, stick with your old car, okay? Uh, but electric cars will help out for a little while. They definitely reduce, reduce pollution, okay? But what we really want to do is get rid of them. I thought I'd, oh, and, and we're coming to, we're going towards electric buses, small and large scale, Uber style transit. Oh, I've got a few more slides on this. I thought, 
I thought, oh, kind of mixed, mixed on worshiping Elon anymore. Uh, you know, but anyway, he, he did Tesla without a doubt led the way in many respects, but looks like some of the other car companies might lap him um, because they're starting to build really good cars and Elon's kind of messing around with Twitter which is kind of a twit thing to do. <laughs> anyway, so we'll have, even if we sell a lot of electric cars, we'll only have them for about one generation. Because you know what? It's just so much smarter, smarter in our cities to be down to, you know, using transit, using bicycles, using walking. And I mean, I don't, you don't have to have a bicycle next Tuesday for your commute. Don't, don't worry, it's not going to be like that. But we're going to make it work, okay? So private cars will become unnecessary in our lifetime. And you'll be happy if you actually look to the, the cost, the money that it takes out of your pocket to own a private car. is just amazing. It's so, so expensive. Plus, it costs society seven or $8,000 a year to subsidize you to keep all the roads and everything going. Okay, so, and look at all that space we're going to get back. If you have a private car, you need a parking space at home, you need a parking space at work, you need a parking space in the senior center, and, 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 uh, and you need roadways to drive on. We're gonna get almost all that space back, right? And do other things with that space because we're gonna have really efficient transit, <laughs> really smart transit. These cute little devils and many that look like it and all different sizes, buses are going to start to come in every size imaginable, right? And you know what you're going to do? You're sitting in your home at 8 o'clock in the morning and you want to go somewhere. You're going to pick up your phone and you're going to push a few buttons and put in a time. And computer mapping systems and timing systems will go, okay, I've got to go pick up Canute at 8.15. And that one of those vehicles will be there. And it'll all be optimized in terms of how we go. We can do We do this now. Uber does it now. Right? Uber picks up. Have you ever been on an Uber ride and all of a sudden the guy says, oh, I'm picking somebody else up and goes two blocks that way and picks somebody else up and then continues on your trip and then takes them somewhere, right? So this is not new technology. It's workable technology. Big electric buses, all scales electric buses, no pollution, easy to, easy to get on and off, you know, so we'll, we'll have electric buses. Planes, trains, and automobiles, mm, mostly disappearing in favor of even intercity. High-speed electric buses is how we should travel intercity. Way more comfortable, way easier, way safer. You know, I think it's, I think your chances of being really badly hurt every time you take a drive, I think a one in 4,000 or something like that. You know, don't, don't quote me on the numbers, but it's really, really, um, you know, I mean, people who are afraid to fly are so sorry to hurt you, which is your phobia, but you're afraid to fly, your chance of dying apparently in your flight is one in 3.7 million or something, but your chance of driving to the Did I say that out loud? Your chance of driving to the airport, you know, is like one in 4,000 to get hurt, right? So, so we'll have these luxury buses, great drivers, professional drivers, using the roads that we still have, and we won't have many people on those roads. I'll come back to that in a minute. High-speed rail. Everybody says, oh, we gotta have high-speed rail across North America. No. North America is too big, it's too expensive. The greenhouse gas and resource footprint to build high-speed rail, except on the really major routes, yes. Calgary Edmonton could probably have high-speed rail, right? There may be some locations where it's, where it's warranted, and I'm, I'm open to it, and I think we should all be open to whatever's best, but there won't be that much high-speed rail, there'll be those high-speed buses. And we'll have electric transport trucks. New paper just out. All of the claims that, ah, oh, we can't use electric transport trucks, they're not going to get us there. You know, we need to try and transport trucks drive long distance. BS. Like 99% of the transport truck trips in North America are less than 500 miles, and the trucks go 500 miles now. Right? No problem. Fully loaded truck can do 500 miles. Now, the other reason I like this plan, we all stink at driving. Okay? I mean, really, professional drivers are amazing. They're much better than us, and it's us driving that kills all the people, you know. Citizens on average are really crappy drivers and they cause crashes and they cause deaths and they cause injuries. So the faster we can get all the citizens off of the roads and just devote the roads to electric vehicles carrying us around in style whenever we need to be carried around, that will be so much better. Okay? We're also going to go to net zero homes. This is my home. I've been on ground-based heating and cooling since 2006. Um, I, I buy green electricity, but I'm looking at putting solar panels on the roof as well. So I should be, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very green already with this, with this home. I haven't had natural gas for, since 2006. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to steal an extra minute, Mary, because I have to tell this. Because, you know, 
back when I was married, if I was at the house, the doorbell would ring and there would be the gas meter person saying, hi, I can't find your gas meter. I said, I don't have one. And the gas meter guy would, almost always a gas meter guy, right, would say, gas meter, you don't have one? Why don't you have one? He said, because I'm on ground by senior and cooling, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, thank you, and on they would go. If my wife answered the door, you know, oh, we don't have a gas meter. No, sweetie, you, you have to have a gas meter. <laughs> you just don't understand. You have to have a gas meter. No, we don't. We have ground based heating and cooling. No, everybody has a gas meter, you know. <laughs> and she got so sick of patronizing people. Anyway, okay, so, yeah. Yeah, what's that? Patronizing oh. males. Oh, definitely males, yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> the 15 minute city. We really should go this way, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, everything within a 15 minute walk, bike ride, transit, right? If you need a car to go to Waterton, you're, you're part of a car share, no problem. You'll have lots of cars available, you know? So you can go on a trip anytime and, and grab a car out of your car share, right? So climate change, crossroad, it's terrifying and it's exciting, right? We have to decide what we're gonna do now speaking specifically to most of this group because I can tell your hair is almost all the same color as mine, okay? You can't leave here and just say that was a cool talk and what should we do this afternoon? Americans with money, that's us, we're Canadians with money, are actually taking action, are pushing, are getting part. Um, Barb was saying to me, Jim, we gotta get the Climate Hub going again. I'd like to see every one of you join the Climate Hub. You know, it's on Facebook. We're almost all on Facebook. And then in fact, Facebook, apparently the young people say, that's for the old folks, you know, they don't go on it anymore. Well, we're all on it. You know, let's, let's get a climate hub going. Let's get lobbying going. Let's get pushing going, okay? We have to push this government. They're apparently dumb and uninformed on so much about climate. We have to push hard at all levels. So humanity needs you to make the future exciting. Please get involved. You can contact me and contact Barb, contact, okay, we'll set up contacts. Thank you very much. Why don't you just sit there and then you'll be available for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, lots to think about and, and what's more you want to hear what actions we're going to take. Uh, we ask that the, we already have one uh, question or a question person I'm lining up on the wall here and so uh, others who want to ask questions please do that remember uh, we ask you to give your name and no pontificating please um, so uh, respectful and and polite discourse and if you if you don't want to get up to ask it put on a sheet of paper and, and put up your hand and I'll come and pick it up and ask it for you. So, uh, we'll ask Jim to come back here because questions are gonna happen. You'll have to adjust this, of course, because he's not my height. <laughs> uh, so, let's start with the questions. Good morning and thank you very much for that provocative talk. You suggest that we're all going to have to suffer quite a lot of pain and discomfort. I grew up in England and was seven or eight when the war broke out. We had food rationing, we had fuel rationing, we had clothes rationing, because there was no alternative, obviously, and we managed, we, we were clothed, we, we also couldn't use cars. Um, any comments on that? Because that was a major threat to, to our lives. Yes. I, I, I completely get it. I understand without a doubt. War times were really tough. Uh, we are, you know, I'm certainly someone my age, still in your 60s, was incredibly lucky to not go. My dad was in the army. Um, you know, they got married during the war. Um, and those were terrible times for so many people and even worse for for some of our european uh, friends and and uh, you know just the, the horrible times they went through yeah for a long time we won't be going through quite what we went through in the war but those things might not be far off that's for sure uh and without a doubt because of climate change there are people starving now a lot of people starving now uh there's huge famine in africa so yeah it, it's it's you know Hopefully we have the social systems to, to, to stay ahead of the change. Uh, 
Terry Shellington. Uh, thank you very much for a passionate presentation. Um, I'm intrigued by your vision of public transportation as being the norm. Uh, I make a trip, it's fine to rent Uber to go to Waterton, but I go once a month to Foremost and I know outside some of our cities it's a, di it's a different world. Um, how do you see rural Canada fitting into that vision or do you? Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, farmers need Farmers need big tractors, and you know, and rural people, there won't be great public transit running, you know, between, uh, you know, between uh, uh, Foremost and, and any other little tiny no, town, right? So that so there will be, I mean, people, you know, will need vehicles in some cases. I'm talking about the the 90 percent of us that actually live in cities, this, the, the scale where we can have the reasonable transit. That's you know, and it's that 90 percent that have to make the change, right? They're they're, they're causing most of the problems with our with our gas guzzling vehicles and so forth. So once we get the 90%, you know, onto public transit, definitely I can see, you know, there are going to be rural folks who will need vehicles. There are going to be people in some careers that will need vehicles. You know, somebody in the Victorian Order of Nurses contacted me and said, what are you talking about? I will need a vehicle. And I said, oh yes, sorry, and then I wasn't talking about you. You know, uh, uh, you know, I see you needing a vehicle to go different places, but uh, most of us can live on transit very comfortably. Or bikes. Or bikes. Or walking. Under the bus. We have a very interesting uh, uh, written question from Deb Gregorash. Tell us about atmospheric rivers and will this increase or lessen the depth of the snowpack in mountains? And what's the future of irrigation? If you want to. See that? No, I, I got it. You got it. No. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the question, Deb. Um, yeah, without a doubt, California is on its 12th atmospheric river this past winter. Okay, I had two or three slides in here on that, and they 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 didn't make the cut along with a lot of other slides. Okay, but yeah. Atmospheric rivers, uh, all that's happening is we, we always got atmospheric rivers. They just weren't that intense. Now, unfortunately, we just have such uh, uh, you know, the gradients are changing, the, the intensities are changing, the humidity's changing, you know, temperatures are up, and so we're starting to get these phenomenal. The picture of, of Lake Tahoe Ski Hill, um, you know, I cut that picture too, but a friend of mine lives at Lake Tahoe and I was talking to her recently, she was literally snowbound in her house, locked in her house, she couldn't get out. Uh, she was okay, she had supplies, uh, but if you saw those, I mean, they had, you know, they had 37, 38 feet of snow, in the pack after it had settled. They had over 50 feet of snow in some places this winter. Uh, so atmospheric rivers, without a doubt, that's, we used to call them Pineapple Express. Now we call them, you know, because it always comes from around Hawaii and it hits, um, you know, the west coast of North America. I was in um, Victoria in 2003 for the very first conference where we were actually dealing with climate change and weather variability and a Pineapple Express hit Victoria over that weekend. Sure made for good news coverage of our conference, I can tell you, They're, the media were just lined up to talk to us about it because Victoria got a record. I think they went from 75, their record was 75 millimeters in 24 hours, and I think they got 118 or something in that 24 hour period, so yeah. They're not gonna go away, they're gonna get worse. Um, and now let's see, oh, and irrigation. Irrigation is gonna be challenging, we're getting warmer. We're gonna be able to grow more. Heat and water, if you've got all the heat and all the water you need, boy, you can grow a lot of crop, okay? Problem is we're gonna have more heat, we're not sure about more water. Most of the work, I had a slide in on my water work and generally the water supply is expected to shrink quite a bit in southern Alberta. So we may really wanna look at, you know, irriga any irrigators here, you know, they don't like to hear this maybe, or some of my irrigation friends, no, we got long-term arrangements, yeah, but, those probably aren't going to hold very well when you've got you know less than half the water and, and a lot more demand. So, yeah. but it gives us opportunities to do. We still have the irrigation system and great soil and lots of heat and maybe we'll do different. I cut all my slides on commercial scale green greenhouses as well. Anyway. So my name is Mark Gettle. I believe I I. I uh, believe that your statement on hydro is right, that, but I think the problem is that we're looking at macro hydro all the time. Big dams, big things. A few years ago I was at the Shadow Mountain Lodge in Banff National Park, off-grid, 
There they have a system. They have just a two inch pipe, goes up the creek, comes down, goes into a box, twice the size of a shoe box. That little thing is spinning like crazy, producing power day and night. At night it's uh, producing the, the power for the lights. In the daytime it's charging batteries. We have a huge potential. Wherever there's water flowing, we, sh we can harvest that. We have an irrigation system that all the irrigation canals could be producing power with no real environmental damage. No need for dams, nothing, but you just have to put those little turbines in areas. So have, have you looked into why has micro hydro been overlooked? Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I, I agree with almost everything that you said except huge potential. I don't think micro has huge potential. Yes, strategically it can work here, there, and many places, and you can do it. Uh, the problem that the irrigation districts have put, you know, some some hydro in in the districts. One of the problems with that is they got to pay for it in the five months that they're operating, right? Or what are they up in six months? So you know, if it pays in six months to pay for that infrastructure and generate electricity for six months, great. Um, and and yeah, you bet they've they've got that advantage. Um, they're going to have less water, and, and uh, you know, so that's a challenge. So yeah, there, there are opportunities, but the big, like the big hydro projects, I think they're all done. You know, they're just, they're, they're you know, any, any, any further just aren't worth it, don't have the economic value, don't have, and lose, lose too much environmentally, but yeah. Thanks very much for coming, Jim, and speaking about this terrifying Climate change. Um, a lot of people. My name is Knut Peterson, by the way. Uh, a lot of people think that, and it's probably true that Alberta is a, just a really small player in the big world. Although our carbon footprint per capita is probably the worst in the world, but reality is that there's some really big players in the world that need to step up in order for things to change because it's climate is not what we do in Alberta doesn't make the climate particularly worse right here it it's a big it's a worldwide thing so what are you going to say to those people that says that we're in, when we're not a big player so why should we bother Yeah, I get, I get this question a lot, and it's a good question. Really what's going on is, do we believe in human rights? Does a Chinese citizen have the same rights as you do? Um, or, or is it able, and I definitely always have a Britain say, Alberta could cut our greenhouse gases to zero and we'd have no impact on the world. Yeah, you bet. But you know what? We are so rich because we've burned so many fossil fuels, and yes, you're right, Canute, the carbon footprint, last time I looked at it, uh, for an average American is about 17 tons, Canadian about 18 tons, for our Alberta between 60 and 70 tons per annum. Ooh. We are horrible consumers of carbon. Now, of course, it's not actually all of us. You know who it is, right? It's the oil and gas. That's who's, who's really, you know, got a massive carbon footprint. Um, you know, so, so uh, Albertans, but for us to say, ah, no, I, I you know, I am trying to tell, sit down with a Chinese citizen, either you speak Mandarin or they speak English, and say, I don't want to cut my 70 tons. You cut your seven. You know, what a crock, right, to say to, the, to a fellow human, you know, there's, there's, we have to lead. We got rich burning fossil fuels for most of the last hundred years. I don't have the numbers and actually I, I wish I would have kept them, but I, I, I had a slide on this too, Canute, that I cut. Um, you know, but it, it had all the slides. And I also calculated the historic. You look at historically, you know, uh, uh, an Albertan, I, I calculated for one of my classes, Albertan versus a Chinese citizen born in 1960. And the Albertan was like 2,700 tons over their lifetime, and the Chinese citizen, who theirs has only gone up to seven in the last decade or two, right? Before that, they were at one and two. So. No, we got rich, we burned all the fossil fuels, we created most of the problem, the richest billions still are creating almost all of the problem. The rich have to cut first dramatically. And the thing is, we can do it. The technology is there and it's cheaper. We'll be trillions of dollars ahead. 
The only people who won't be dollars ahead are the oil and gas companies that keep lying to us about why we need oil and gas. Thanks, Jim. Um, I know that you have faith in the big companies that produce vehicles, that they're going to actually act responsibly, but every time I turn on the TV, they are advertising not, not sound vehicles, but vehicles that will tear up the countryside, and every single car manufacturing company is doing the same kind of advertising. How can we get to them? Give your name. Give your name. Oh, sorry, Francis Schultz. <laughs> Thanks, Francis. Yeah, uh, I, okay. I obviously left one missing, one one wrong impression. No, I have absolutely no faith in almost any corporation anywhere. They, corporate, the corporate structure is set up for them to push all their costs on on others, and then they take all the profits, right? So when they're profitable, hey, this is ours. When things aren't going so well, hey, you gotta help us, right? And so no, that that's, yeah. If you haven't seen the two movies, movie series in 2003 and 2021 called The Corporation and The New Corporation, you really need to watch those two movies, okay? They're, they're so worth it. Corporate structures are so, corporate structures are destroying our, they're, they're what's really destroying things, okay? So we have to change the corporate structures. One of them is making them responsible for murder, without a doubt, you know, if, if, it's, if it's criminal, activity and I think it is when you're lying about your emissions and you're lying about about you know how much you're going to and when you make up stories about how you're going to fix it and northern Alberta right now they want to start releasing treated tailings into the Athabasca River system and they've been I've been following that for my entire career before they haven't effectively rehabilitated a trivial portion of the tailings ponds they've been lying the whole time about building technology to end pit lakes and so forth. And I know, I reviewed dozens of environmental impact assessments for oil sands. And the regulator is stacked with oil and gas people. And so that's, they always said, Burn doesn't know what he's talking about. The oil, we trust the oil companies, right? That's, that, was, that was literally in the final reports, right? So yeah, corporations, we, we have a lot to change, okay? We, can do it as seniors. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Like you, Trevor, Trevor Page. Like Thank you. Like you, uh, I worked, I went into retirement, being called back, working again. Not for academia, for the UN, okay, on climate change. And unlike you, I didn't get my tongue stuck to cold metal. I grew up in the hot lands of Africa, Middle East and Asia. Climate change is already on much of the world. Okay, Somalia, fourth consecutive year of drought, people starving to death. Couple of countries over, South Sudan, four consecutive years of floods, the Sud, is uh, expanding continuously. Farmland underwater for four years. People are migrating now. It's not just Donald Trump that's building walls. We're doing it in Europe too. People don't sit still when they're about to die. They move. Okay, now. They're going to move to the US. You've seen what's happening down in Mexico. They're going to move to Canada too. It costs us 50 cents a day to keep people in their own country. It costs us $40 a day to look after them when they, if they don't drown in the Mediterranean and get to Europe. I don't think Danielle Smith doesn't know about the science. She's just sort of in line with oil and gas. So we need to get organized. Now, what do we do here for Southern Alberta? That's my question to you, okay? What do we do for uh, 
our economy down here, which is agriculture. Yes, the glaciers are mounting, and we need water for agriculture, but we've got to get our act together now in terms of conserving it, building irrigation systems and reservoirs. So what are we doing about that? Thank, thank you, Trevor. I agree with everything you said about the developing world, without a doubt. They are paying for rich people to have rich lifestyles and to burn all those fossil fuels. Now and historically, Trevor's bang on, without a doubt. I mean, you know, the things that he could give, he could give that talk on the developing world and be just as compelling and really more so. People are dying, people are starving, and I think I barely had a chance to give that a little lip service. So Trevor, you're completely right. And, and how much of that criminal responsibility do we bear if we're doing nothing? Because that metaphorically to put it, you know, why I want you all to show up at the, and let's have a seniors climate hub of Southern Alberta and let's show up on City Hall, you know, maybe once a month or every two weeks all goddamn summer and let them know that we want something done. Um, you know, and because we did have some youth and we got, and we, I think one, time, one, you know, one Friday we had about 500 people out there. Uh, and those kids were amazing, but you know, kids, our kids and they're trying to live their lives in high school and everything. So I think we really need to do something. Metaphorically, I'm going to put it to you this way. You know more now than you came in, and most of you probably knew this anyway, but you know more than when you came in for this talk. And I suggest that if you're not doing anything, it's like you're walking by a child that's been run down right out in that road, and you just keep walking. Because there's millions of children millions of people who are starving now because of climate change and you need to at least try to do something because we've lived incredibly gifted lives. We've been the richest people in the world and the richest generation in the history of humanity and we got to give back now. We really desperately have to give back now. Thanks for the question, Joe. <laughs> My name is Doug Neal, <clears throat> and I don't know whether I should tell you this or not, but I started driving a bus in Winnipeg when people parked their cars for a winter. And I like the story about uh, transportation in the winter, uh, win uh, in, in the future. And I'm kind of wondering, <clears throat> um, Every time, every time there was a, uh, people stopped, got their cars out, and people stopped getting on the bus, transit cut a bus off. The more people that left the bus, the more buses that left the street. And I'd like to know how in the world are you going to convince people that they should wait 10 minutes or 15 minutes for for somebody to come and they'd have to get up off their butt and get on a bus with a whole bunch of other people when they can walk out the door and get in their car. Um, and there's in one other thing too. I've seen uh, in operation um, garbage being used to produce electricity and the emissions weren't that good, and there's a never-ending never supply of fuel for producing ele electricity. So why are we depending on wind and solar when we got it right there in our own kitchens? Yeah, I'll answer your second question first because I remember it for sure. I'm, you know, I'm getting up there too. You know, you can't can't be too. Uh, um, yeah, no. I, okay, without a doubt, there is some things we can do with garbage. We have a research program actually at the University of Lethbridge. I've got a PhD candidate. I co-supervise that that candidate with uh, Paul Hesendunk, a chemist, and we're looking at using a process called hydrothermal liquefaction, which is a chemical heat process to convert nutrients to biocrudes. Okay, so. That's what I want. It's ridiculous that we're spending 
the city of Calgary has spent billions of dollars on their wastewater treatment plants and it cost them millions of dollars to run them every year. That's a resource. I think we could be turning that into a green biofuel, okay? So we want to convince Calgary and Lethbridge and everywhere else to do that transformation, uh, you know, and, and, and we also put al algae in the mix because the algae can take that, those nutrients grow and produce a lot more oils and nutrients and so forth and a lot more, and so we can harvest all that. So that's something I think we can do. In terms of, of uh, you know, burning other stuff maybe that goes to the landfill, you know, I, I, I suggest, I haven't looked at any research lately, but it's, you know, it's not that much when you think of it, you know, even if you're throwing out your full gray bin every two weeks, that's really not enough, you know, a lot of material to, to provide you with energy for, to, for that two weeks, right? So, you know, in, in, without a doubt, we can do some things with some of our wastes, but, you know, the biggest thing I see happening is in wastewater, and though, because those nutrients are in wastewater, they're also in agricultural waste, they're also in industrial waste, so we think we're on to something that produce a lot of bio crudes that, that, you know, so that's something we're working on. And now, what was get your first the question? Bus. Leave the car at home and get Oh, the yes. Oh, yes. Good. Yeah, but, but it's, no, you, you, you know, I mean, I know there's probably a few of you don't have these. You know what? You're probably happier inside because you don't. But, but, uh, but no, I mean, you, no, you're, you're, it, I think it's easier. I think it's more comfortable. I, I, there's Lydia an app, I go, you know, it pick up, it, it automatically transmits and says, Jim lives at this address, and Jim, wa and I put in, I want to be picked up at 8.15. And then the, the system does it all, and, and the bus shows up in front of my door, the little mini bus, and then yeah. takes me off to the bus terminal. It's, it's a better system than having your car, yeah, and warm. yeah, yeah. Warm, exactly, warm, and you don't have to pay the m most extravagant insurance fees in the damn country because somebody took the fees off. Don't want to mention Daniel Smith's name, but anyway, that's, uh, actually, I think it was Jason Kenny, but anyway. Or scrape the windows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is our last question. Uh, hi, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, thank you for your emphatic presentation. <laughs> um, what I'd like to ask is, we have a lot of technology that's come. Solar panels are a tenth the price they were 12 years ago. Um, batteries are making wild progress. Um, there's other technology, and you might want to comment on it, like high temperature superconductivity and fusion. Is there any other things that you see that are coming our way that will help us a lot and maybe um, uh, modify your oil friends? Oh, one of the nice things about being, you know, a scientist and being involved in some agencies, and my colleagues got to do these things once in a while too, like like Dave and others, you know, and, and Mark. Um, sometimes you end up at a conference and just you bump in on the right person, and it's just wonderful to talk to that person. Uh, I was at the American Geophysical Union in 2017. I went to a, a really cool event where there was several hundred people. One of the speakers was Stephen Chu, Nobel laureate and former Energy Secretary for Obama. Anyway. After we're all having wine, and I ended up face to face with Stephen Chu, and he kind of smiled at me, went to turn, turn away, and instead I said, Secretary Chu, can we talk about nuclear? And it turned out we both agreed on just about everything. Nuclear, you mentioned fusion, you no, know, nuclear doesn't work, it costs way too much to build, it usually costs almost 20 years to, from, from first proposal to even get it built. Every nuclear, you know, plant that we've built in the last 20 or 30 years has gone two and three times over budget, um, you know, and they still have a greenhouse gas footprint. You still have to mine their fuels. You still have to ship their fuels. You still have to refine their fuels. Uh, you know, then, then afterwards, you have to store them for like 10,000 years, you know? Uh, actually, it's 100,000 half-lives, right? I mean, you have, to, you have to store them forever, and we're inflicting them on future generations. So nuclear doesn't work. Now, there is something called small modular reactors, which we think, and again, Secretary Chu and I agreed on that, and I was glad to educate him. He was, you know, he was willing to learn. Okay, yeah. no, so anyway, so, you know, we agreed, yeah, SMR could work in 20 years, but he agreed, I agreed, all of my, just about all of my colleagues working, there's, we don't need to go other places. I did mention ground-based heating and cooling. That's in my house, two blocks that way. Right? And works like a charm. I haven't had any other source of hot or cold in my house since 2006. Okay? Um, 
And, and so that works like a charm. Uh, but beyond that, solar, wind, battery, existing hydro, maybe some geothermal heat in places, some geothermal uh, electricity in places where it works. Those are so cost effective and the technology just works so well uh, that that's, you know, I just can't see. Not that I wouldn't support a research program. If somebody comes up and says, I got this cool widget that I think will save the world, if they can get it by referee, you know, by reviews, great, fund research. Research and development costs almost nothing compared to making the mistakes. So anyway, that's kind of my perspective. I think, I think we have the technology to save ourselves. Thanks, okay. thanks everybody. Yes, a big thank you to Jim. We, we have one more task for you. Uh, the speaker often gives a message to us to take home, uh, something we can think about or do or whatever, and you've already partially given us a message, a challenge. Do you have something else you want to say to the people? I've already said it, but I'll say it again. Yes, that's good. You need to help. If you're just going home today, then why the hell did you come? Pardon my, you know, if, if that's all you're going to do is go home. We are in a desperate state. We are in a horrible state. And as Trevor said, you know, it's not just, it's not even just the one kid running down on the street here that we can help. You know, you go to Somalia, there's, you know, whatever it is, tens to hundreds of thousands of kids that desperately need help. And a lot of that help can come from us. I mean, yes, yeah, us cutting greenhouse gases isn't going to feed them tomorrow, but it sure the heck will make it better for them in five years and 10 years and 20 years and to make it better for the world. So, you know, we need to get the message out. And I, I just think, my God, a whole bunch of us old folks just making a shitload of noise. I think that's a great idea. Let's go do that, okay? Uh, I really appreciate when it. When you want us to gather, it's Come, if you, if you, you know what, there is a group on, there is a group on, uh, on Facebook called Lethbridge Youth Climate Strikes. If we need it, maybe we'll change the name to be all inclusive of, of, of age. We don't want any ageism going on, and it was a youth, youth initiative initially. Uh, but, you know, let's, that's just, if you join that group, and we'll start, to, we'll really get that going again, and it would be great to, uh, you know, and what's, What's wrong? We can have picnics we on Friday afternoons. There, yeah, we can have the raging grannies there. We could have picnics on Friday afternoons in front of City Hall and make some noise and, and just let it be known that, damn it, we're not going to take it anymore. I think somebody said that before me, but thank you so much for listening.